All right. So we looked at ionic solvation, where molecules with a partially negative end of molecules of water uh, nestle up against and, and are attracted to the positive ions. We've looked at nonpolar or, or non-ionic but polar kinds of solvation. This is a simple sugar where the water molecules are hydrogen bonding or attracted to a polar end on the sugar and pulling it out kind of like the um, the way that uh, pallbearers hold on to a casket. Okay? What? I'm sorry. He didn't want, he didn't want me talking about funerals, I guess. Okay. All right. So what we want to talk about now is a, the last category that we're going to talk about in here, and that's nonpolar solvation. Nonpolar solvation. Okay. Remember, nonpolar molecules are not completely nonpolar. The way that any nonpolar molecule is attracted to another nonpolar molecule is through what's called a London force, and London forces are the result of shifts in electron density. So inside any nonpolar molecule or atom, the electrons are constantly moving around. Okay? Yeah. Well, actually, we've got to wait till Robbie comes back. So um, anytime any, th this nonpolar molecule or atom has the electrons moving around at very, very fast speeds near the speed of light, and so sometimes those electrons are more <laughs> gathered up on one side. In fact, more often than not, they're unevenly just distributed in the electron cloud, which creates a temporary polarity. If the electrons are unevenly distributed, James, Schuyler, So the kind of temporary polarity that can occur, temporary, when the electrons are just shifted around, creates a situation where partially positive and negative ends can still be attracted, okay? They can still be attracted to each other, but it's temporary, all right? That's a weak attraction, okay? Nevertheless, if I have a substance that's made of nonpolar molecules, okay? Uh, let's see. How about we're going to dissolve? Propane in gasoline. And so this is propane, this is octane. They're both nonpolar. Propane is nonpolar, and because of this temporary shift in electron density, it can be dissolved by another nonpolar molecule. But that just means that propane molecules are surrounded by these gasoline molecules because of the temporary shifts in electron density. Okay? So it's all a matter of some polarity, but this is temporary. Now, so why is it then that a polar molecule, permanently polar, doesn't dissolve in something that's nonpolar very well? That's because the strength of polarity, the strength of these dipole-dipole um, interactions are much stronger than the temporary polarity. Okay? The strength of attraction between permanently polar molecules, the dipole-dipole attractions, are much stronger than the molecules or particles that are nonpolar. So the permanently polar molecules tend to stick together and push out the nonpolar ones. Does that make sense? So it's not that water will, won't dissolve in gasoline. It's the gasoline is that water refuses to join up with gasoline. Okay? Gasoline, it's not that gasoline doesn't like water, it's like water doesn't like gasoline. Does that make sense? But nevertheless, we call gasoline hydrophobic. 
word is hydro, meaning water, phobic, meaning afraid of, not liking. Gasoline is hydrophobic because it doesn't like water. It won't dissolve in water very easily. Okay? On the other hand, something that dissolves in water that easily, like sugar dissolves in water or an alcohol dissolves in water, that's called hydrophilic. Uh, H is P Y in it. Yeah. Philip. Like Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Something that loves water is hydrophilic. Wait a minute, remember. Well, I was actually wrong. It's H. -H it's P I P H I L L I C. I was right the first time. Hydrophilic. I can't believe I couldn't remember how to spell that. Okay. So hydrophobic and hydrophilic just means doesn't like water, does like water. Does that make sense? So salts and acids and alcohols, polar things, are hydrophilic. Oils and gasoline are hydrophobic. That makes sense? Alright, so your body is 70% water. And the whole reason that your body is not a puddle on the, on the floor is because you have all these uh, protein structures that are largely hydrophobic. We talked about that last Tuesday a little bit in a different form. Okay? So, three kinds of solvation. This is also solvation, where we're solvating nonpolar stuff with nonpolar stuff. This is a form of solvation. Okay? Any kind of dissolving involves solvation. It's the way that the particles interact to create the solution. That's what solvation is. So, you've got the solvation that is nonpolar or nonpolar. You've got the solvation which is polar to polar, and you've got the solvation which is ionic to polar. Does that make sense? And there are other kinds, and we're not going to get into those in this class. All right? Fair enough? This one right here was nonpolar. This is nonpolar and nonpolar we're talking about. Nonpolar and nonpolar. Okay? And remember, all these particles, for it to be a solution, for true solvation to occur, the particles have to be how small? Uh, one nanometer. Or smaller. A nanometer or smaller. Okay? For it to be a true solution, it has to be a nanometer or smaller. Okay? All right. What happens if it's not a nanometer or smaller? Hmm? Well, that's the next thing we'll talk about. What happens if it's not? 